So talking about narrative motion and how we can set some of this up, and again, I keep coming back to it, but leading the viewer's eye through a composition, um, how to create motion, and how to uh, create a sense of narrative um, through a variety of tools. Some will be new and some will be familiar. So looking at this kind of wacky illustration painting, this kind of has a whole bunch of things that we've been talking about throughout the semester. Um, leading a viewer's eye essentially around a piece. Um, this is a bit more of an abstract narrative. But you can see we have a lot of horizontals, a lot of vertical lines, a lot of, um, I wanted to say arbitrary, but that's not it. Um, a lot of different types of shapes leading your eye around the piece, right? So we have these strong, almost vertical, but diagonal lines. And then we have these kind of horizontal and vertical squiggly lines. And then we have these kind of drooping squiggly lines. But you can see you kind of can create a sense of motion and a sense of uh, leading the viewer's eye through a piece through a variety of shapes, colors, etc. right? You'll also have things on the next slide, we'll start talking about it. But you also have things like objects relating to each other. Um, one of the things that we can do as designers um, we'll have objects relate to each other either by type, um, by color, they can have multiple relationships. So like in this case, like these two objects are a similar shape, so they'll have sort of like a contextual relationship. Um, this black squiggly and this white squiggly will have a relationship because they're similar shapes even though they're different colors. Um, I'm trying to find two different, like this white shape and this white shape will sort of have a relationship because they're both of similar color, et cetera, things like that. You can get a little bit more simple, obviously, with these things. So some of the things that we've talked about throughout the semester, line, value, texture, volume, space, and color, um, can all relate like elements within a design. So like I said, like a black circle will relate to both a black square and a red um, circle because they're both circles, right? So the black or the circle will relate to the other circle even though they're different colors and the black will relate with black, right? So even, actually, so even if we look at these three, like these three objects in a design, I mean they're somewhat arbitrary, and then the text as well will sort of interact and relate to each other being all the same color, right? So we have our classic uh, Grant Wood American Gothic painting. I'm sure you guys have seen or have seen some sort of iteration of it. It's been used culturally and appropriated a, a bazillion times, probably. Um, there's a lot of different design elements that we've been talking about through the semester with this image specifically. Um, can you guys point some out? Or do you guys see any sort of interacting elements in this layout? You guys, oh, there you go. I was going to say, you guys are quiet too. My first class didn't talk at all. Yeah? So here and here? Yep. Yeah. That's a great example. So the white, yeah. So you have the white of her collar and the sort of white of his shirt. And if you even kind of dig specifically, there's this sort of similar shape with the top of his collar and his neck, and a sort of similar shape with the top of her collar and her neck. Anything else? I mean, there's a ton, but some are obvious, some are less obvious. So we have things like that going on. We also have our, going back to our line work, we have this nice implied line not quite looking directly at him, but you have this sort of implied implied line with this eye contact she's given him. So we have a lot of different elements interacting, but one of the more repeated elements here is, is the similar shape, right? So we have this similar shape with their heads, again, sort of going back to the collar here, even in here, and in the bib of his overalls reflected in the pitchfork, and then even reflected upside down in the window. And then you even have with the bib and the middle line, pitchfork in the middle line, window in the middle line. They don't all have to be exactly the same shape, but similar shapes, right? We also have a lot of really strong horizontal and vertical line work 
to add stability to the background of the image as well. So none of this is by accident, right? These are all sort of thought out, um, thought out decisions um, when creating um, that piece in particular. Talking about motion, this is an older slide from an earlier lecture, but we've talked about how shapes and objects have somewhat inherent, um, uh, now I'm blanking, uh, somehow inherently imply motion, right? So even some of these more arbitrary shapes, since they taper off, this has a, um, a sort of sense of pointing down. This one has a sense of sweeping left to right, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about the hammer, since the head of the hammer is is lower and the handle is sort of pointing upwards. You have this um, sort of sense of a downstroke with a hammer. And that goes to context, right? We all are relatively familiar with this shape and object. So there's some, I don't want to say cultural, but there's some cultural context to it, which will come up later in this presentation. So with these two sort of arbitrary objects, um, what would be uh, the directional movement that these two objects could be implying? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. So we have this triangle that has a sense of movement from left to right or pointing to the right. And then this, yeah, sort of pentagon shape has a sense of pointing down. Um, so when we talk about, it doesn't have to necessarily just be objects that have this sort of sense of pointing, motion, etc. It can be in your composition. Again, we've talked about this a little bit before in a couple of other different presentations. Um, but this study in particular from Rembrandt, a study for a painting, um, you can see some, uh, there's some aerial perspective in here. Um, there's a little bit of um, value perspective, things like that. But when you have a group of objects that are somewhat related, and in this case, this group somewhat has this kind of like triangular shape. So there's a sort of triangular block where there's like values and like details where the detail in the background really drops off. The detail in the background starts to drop off here. There's darker values with the shadow of the gentleman that's being cast. There's darker shadows of this column that are being cast. So these objects will kind of relate to each other. And then that'll sort of start to form relationships with all of these objects, even though they're not exactly the same. They're somewhat related, and they kind of have this sort of shape, this kind of triangular viewing pattern, right? So as it says, like any element or part joining in a directed movement will relate uh, with other participants in that action, no matter how different the elements are, right? So obviously, the guy and these big blocks of shape are very different, but um, there's a similar amount of detail in all of these elements within this area, right? You can create tension. We've talked about this. Again, a lot of this is not necessarily going to be review, but stuff that should be familiar. You can create tension with where objects lie in the frame of your composition, right? We've talked about static versus dynamic. So this would be sort of more of a, uh, it's very, very simplified, but this would be more of a, a static composition, right? So we have our two objects kind of dead center-ish. Um, you know, one's a little bit higher up, so there's a little bit of dynamics going on, but um, two objects in relation to each other, some of the things that, not limited to this, but some of the things that they can uh, sort of represent is change. Um, the two objects can either potentially present like they're going to meet or repel each other. Um, they can alter another shape or location. So the objects give, uh, the objects present a possibility of change given their relationship, right? So depending on how we look at it, we can look at these two circles kind of maybe coming together, being pushed apart, et cetera, et cetera. But then when we look at a little bit more of a dynamic layout versus a static layout, we really just kind of moved the two circles off to the right and up in the frame a little bit. But since that placement has changed, it also increases the tension, right? There's a potential, there's more of a sense of motion. There's a potential that the circles may go off the page. Um, there's a, a, a more drastic difference between figure ground. So the imbalance on the ground um, gives more of a suggestion of movement rather than in this slide where they're kind of more static, dead center, right? So you can play with tension within your, um, within your frame 
to create tension and movement. And then we have this sort of like our odd arbitrary shape um, to show tension within an object, right? So how is tension shown within this object specifically? So what we have is sort of this kind of like teardrop or, again, it's not necessarily cultural, but some context helps here. But if you think about it in sort of this idea of like a liquid, right, if you have like a dew drop hanging onto a leaf or something like that, the, the bottom weight of the droplet becomes heavy, 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 and then it kind of can't hang on to the leaf anymore as the top gets thinner and thinner and then eventually drops off. So we get this sort of sense of since this object is bottom weighted so heavily and the top tapers, we get this sort of heavy tension of this object being pulled down, right? So with the pressure at the lower end, um, the directed action is this action of sort of this pulling down, potential pulling down tension, right? So going back again to sort of our line work with these compositions, um, is there one of these compositions that might suggest more tension than the other? Yeah? You say left? Yeah. Correct. Yep, so the one on the left would have more tension. Again, going back to our line discussions, um, where we have on the right, they're very similar, but on the right we have a lot more almost horizontal, almost vertical. But we have a lot more essentially horizontal vertical lines that give it more stabilizing. Uh, whereas here, there's, I don't think any at all, or very few, if any, horizontal vertical lines. So there's really not uh, a huge sense of stability in this composition, given the line work, right? It's more dynamic. There's a lot more sweeping um, curved elements. So even like this curved element here, gives a, a sense of motion of either left to right, but sort of going, if you look at it, top right, bottom left, or vice versa. So there's a lot more movement, a lot more tension in the piece on the left. Right? So I just said all that. I keep getting ahead of myself in my slides. Um, multiple images, alignment, and blurring can also um, create a sense of movement to go along with a sense of tension. Um, so as we can see, in this left image, we have these objects that some of them are similar, but they're all basically a, a white object with a black outline, so they would relate to each other. But just given their alignment, or misalignment in this case, they give sort of a sense of toppling or sort of like wobbling back and forth, right? And then if you take that a step further, and you don't necessarily close the images, you have less stable shapes, right, since the shapes aren't closed, and then you add more action lines, it really adds to the sort of dynamics um, or potential dynamics of these objects and the sense of movement, right? It gives you a little bit more, I feel, it gives you a little bit more of a sense of a smoother movement, but I think it gives you a sense of more movement than the image on the left, right? Or correct. So in this painting, I always butcher the name, so I have to look at my notes. Um, Oscar Kukushka, um, Bride of the Wind. How would you describe the illusion of motion in this painting? There's a lot of questions in this lecture today. So a lot like Starry Night, we have a lot of swirling motions. Right, overall, in the overall um, composition, right, we have a general sort of sense of sweeping and swirling if you look at sort of this outside area here. But then there's sort of little pockets of that sort of repeated overlapping and swirling shapes with their feet. Here, there's you get this sort of pocket of swirling, you get sort of down here another, and then somewhat separated by color. You have the two bodies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you have a lot of different shapes working here, a lot of um, unfocused shapes, overlapping, unstable positions, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, to sort of give this illusion of motion, right? Sort of similar to, so I'm going back a couple, sort of similar to this right side of these shapes versus the left side of these shapes. We see it present sort of more in context, in practice with this painting, right? Figurative influences. So this is where I talked about um, previous knowledge or context, in this case, um, of an object, right? So pre-existing knowledge of elements, we talked about the hammer. Um, so prior knowledge that we have about the nature of elements represented, their weight, density, and behavior can influence how we interpret uh, motion, right? So if we look at this as if it's a balloon, we have this sense of this is a floating object floating up. It's very light, very airy, etc. Or if we picture it as a cement ball hitting a metal rod, we get a complete opposite sense of this large, heavy object compressing another sort of somewhat heavy object, right? So depending on context, there's two very, very different readings of these two elements. Then we sort of shift on how to apply these into narrative movement, um, either figuratively or sort of in air quotes physically, right? So creating narrative movement through, again, leading the viewer's eye through the piece or having sort of more physical movement in a piece. So like in this case, um, the discovery and proof of the cross, we start to look at a couple different types of narratives where this is um, a narrative that is multiple parts of one story in a picture plane. And we'll study this a little bit further, but you can see the different sort of parts of the story are separated if you kind of consider this where the architecture starts as a frame. So we have one part of the story here. We have one part of the story here that's sort of separated by the mountains and the top of the crucifix here. And then we have another part of the story with the background, right? These these elements here are, are just fragments of the actual painting. This is a fresco, um, so it's um, paint on uh, wet clay, um, and then the clay dries, and then you have a fresco. So this is actually pieces that are missing. These aren't actually in, in the piece, right? So narrative art, I'm not gonna read this whole slide, but so narrative art is basically art that tells a story, right? Super simple. Either as a moment or an ongoing story, a sequence of event unfolding over time, right? A lot of times stories are used, uh, are told using semiotics. We'll get into that a little more specifically. But visual cues or signs are combined into patterns that transmit messages to the viewer. This is where, in semiotics, is where some context really helps um, and cultural context. So we have here, um, a lot of ancient pictures um, can be difficult to interpret because generally they're not really organized in a systematic way. Um, and then also um, sort of cultural background information helps to inform uh, pieces like that, right? Um, so we have um, pictures, uh, dichronic versus uh, synchronic stories told over time. Um, so if you think about like, like a photograph versus a film, so you have a photograph which is like one technically one snapshot of a moment in time, or you have um, like a film, even if it's a short film, you have more of a timeline, so you have many snapshots, right? So you have a sequence of images, so that would be synchronic. Um, yeah, so different cultures have developed different ways uh, to discern narrative action from pictures, right? So a lot of different cultures will potentially shift um, or inform our viewing of pieces. So when we talk about semiotics, essentially there's three types of, I don't want to say images, but three types of elements within semiotics. Um, you have iconic, symbolic, and indexical, right? So you have iconic, which is essentially um, an illustrative representation of an object that you're talking about. So in this case, like a stick figure representing a person. You have symbolic, something that's not representative, but it's a symbol of an object or action. So in this case, a stop sign, right? It's a symbol of stopping, right? So there's kind of no straightforward way to represent the action of stopping within 
you know, one simple image, right? So this stop sign becomes a symbol for the action of stopping, right? And then you have indexical, in this case, something actually pointing, but it's usually something that kind of indicates another thing. So like the classic example is smoke and fire, like where there's smoke, there's fire. Usually you can't have fire without smoke. So the smoke is an index of the fire because it's kind of technically the smoke is pointing to the fire. And then we have a little bit more um, concrete examples here of a heart. So we have our iconic representation of the heart, this somewhat medical illustration. And then we have the symbolic. So we have the sort of classic Valentine heart, right? And then this is where these last two, but this is where cultural influences can potentially um, change how you read. So a lot of times this heart is a symbol for love, right? But that might not be present in every single culture, right? And then we have the index. So we have a gentleman clutching his chest, kind of like a sort of classic symbol of, of heart trauma or heart issues, right? So it's not necessarily directly representing. You don't have a direct representation of the heart, but you have this action pointing to the heart. So basically an iconic sign effectively looks like what it represents. Um, a symbolic sign doesn't look like what it represents and its meaning must be learned. So that's again where cultural references or context often is needed um, to discern a symbolic sign. And an indexical sign um, is a clue that links meaning again. So for like where there's smoke, there's fire. A pointing finger is an indexical sign of whatever it's pointing at. So if you have a pointing finger pointing to an exit sign, the finger is an index of the exit sign. And then we have this sort of in action in contemporary art um, with Joseph Kosuth and his one, one and three chairs piece. It's one of my favorite pieces, actually. Um, so we have this sort of in action, right? So we have three different versions of a chair or of this particular chair, right? And they're all correct. So we have the actual chair. And we have a photograph of the chair. And then we have a definition of the chair, right? So here, the definition of the chair would essentially be like an indexical sign. And then, and I'm blanking on, um, we have the symbolic chair and then a, or, or iconic. Um, and then we have the actual object in and of itself, right? Um, this is another, I won't read this whole thing, but this is another example of semiotics in action um, with Walton Ford and this falling bow image um, where a lot of cultural information, like it's an interesting image to begin with, but then the cultural um, information can help inform or shift meaning to the viewer, right? So we have the iconic part of semiotics here, right? The identifiable scene, the log looks like a log, the pigeon looks like a pigeon, right? So they're pretty direct. Symbolic, so in cultural terms, the passenger passenger pigeons represent societal short-sightedness, bloodlust, violence against nature, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then indexical, the falling log suggests imminent danger or destruction, so on and so forth. Um, so there's essentially more background information needed for the symbolic and sometimes the indexical versions of um, signs and semiotics. So we move on to actually constructing some of these narratives, right? And how we can construct narratives. Um, so we have monoscenic narrative, which is basically kind of like a photograph. So it's a scene um, that depicts, or a narrative rather, that depicts a single scene with no repetition of characters or elements. Um, and there's only one action taking place. It's basically fairly easily identifiable, right? So in this classic image of the Last Supper, to sort of distill it or oversimplify it, we have a decent amount of people having dinner and you're taking a snapshot, right? And then you have synoptic narrative um, going to having multiple actions or multiple scenes taking place in one composition, right? So in this case, and I always butcher his name, uh, Masaccio, uh, in the tribute money, we have one story happening in in one panel, so multiple 
points of the story happening in, in one panel, right? So we have um, in this middle scene is technically where it starts. We have the tax collector here talking to Jesus, Jesus and his disciples. Um, and the tax collector is demanding his money, as they do. They don't have money. So Jesus tells Joseph to go fish. And when you pull a fish, you'll uh, search his mouth, and then you'll find money within the fish's mouth. So it's Jesus performing a miracle. And then in this other scene, we have Joseph paying paying the tax collector. And the way, you, I don't know if I said this, but the way you can tell that, that this in particular is a tax collector, aside from being dressed very differently, all these other gentlemen have a halo. He does not. So that would indicate that he is different from them. Um, so in this slide, it's, it's broken up a little bit more. So we have scene one in the middle, and then scene two, where he actually goes and fishes, and it's kind of broken up by some of these trees and where some of this aerial perspective breaks away. And then we have scene three, which is a little bit easier to discern, where we have the mountainside sort of fading into some of the architecture to sort of separate the scenes from each other, right? And then we have continuous narrative, which is similar to synoptic narrative, but basically what ends up happening is you have multiple scenes of a narrative happening within a single frame, like the slide before, but the multiple actions and scenes are not necessarily as separated, right? So in this case, um, this is Hans Melming's uh, Scenes from the Passion of the Christ. We have, in this particular panel, at least 23 vignettes pictured throughout Christ's life. So they're not necessarily broken up like the last uh, image, but you can see some repetitions. You see Christ here, you see Christ here, Christ is down here somewhere, and then he's in over here in this crowd somewhere, and then, so you start, you start to see characters repeated throughout um, throughout the composition. But if you took the people out of the composition, it almost looks like one snapshot. So the way to tell that it's a continuous narrative is that's where you start to see those repeated characters or the repeated elements, right, within a continuous narrative. You have progressive narrative, um, which is seen often in um, Roman and Greek architecture and art. So you have multiple actions taking place in order to convey a passing of time. Um, usually they're a sequence um, and it's dependent on its location. So like in this case, up in the frieze of this architecture, you might start in the top left and read left to right and then go around the corner and then read. So it's almost like a timeline. You know, think about it as like a timeline stretched out in this case, along a frieze, or even this story is a short timeline in the top of this element. So it looks almost like one single image, but again, it sort of is location dependent, right, in a progressive narrative. It's almost like a stretched out timeline. And then we have sequential narrative, which is sort of the more classic, classic narrative. We're all relatively familiar with it, right, with comic books and comic illustrations, newspaper illustrations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, each scene and action is represented within its own frame as a unit. Each frame is a particular scene during a particular moment. So it's multiple snapshots put together, again, sort of like separating a timeline in this case. Um, so you have you know, each moment of action in an individualized frame. So we have a little ghost doing some trick-or-treating and getting the candy and all that fun stuff. And then at the end, you have a little punchline. It's an adult on their knees. Very funny. Um, Essentially, uh, before culturally people were literate, even in North America, um, before literacy was more prevalent, um, narrative uh, sequential art um, was a relatively easy, quick way to get a narrative across without any text, right? So there's zero text in here, but we kind of all understand what's happening. Um, so it was a way to convey an idea um, or a story um, without having to use text or without having to use words, right? Um, yeah, so I mentioned the newspaper, comic strips, comic books, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are a variety of, it's not, obviously not everything you can do with narrative, but some of the things that we have been looking at throughout the semester, I believe that's the end, yeah. Um, some of the things that we've been looking at throughout the semester and how we can sort of link them together to now start creating narratives um, through some of these things that we've, um, started to work with earlier on.